Um, so for the sake of time, um, we leave questions to the, to the end of this session. I'm just going to call uh, Dr. Mike Bavalacqua to give an update on initiatives provincially uh, for polycystic kidney disease. Great, thank you very much. Um, and I'd also like to thank uh, Dr. Chapman for coming and giving us a wonderful update uh, on the recent evidence. So what I'm gonna do for the next few minutes now is actually take us through how we're translating some of these new insights into clinical care uh, here in BC. Um, we've had a bit of a change in the time, so I might be skipping through some of the slides. And I may actually, uh, Stephanie, if you can get you to just not do the live polling questions, you guys will be off the hook. I'll just give you the answers as we go through. Um, I do have some disclosures uh, with some interactions from uh, Atsuka, including with the, the um, development of the registry that I'm going to be talking about today. So the first question I was going to pose to you guys is if we had to estimate how many British Columbians are living with the disease, and again, I'll let you off the hook here, but we'd say based on population estimates, we'd say there's somewhere between five, maybe even as high as 11,000 uh, people living with the disease. And the reason that I have to say estimate is because we actually don't really know here in BC. To date, we haven't had good data tracking on this. And from everything we just heard from, from Dr. Chapman, early identification is going to be key. By the time we're seeing the complications, by the time we're seeing them in our chronic kidney disease and our transplant and dialysis units, we've missed the boat. If we're gonna really wanna change the trajectory of this disease, we need to know as early as we can who these patients are and where they are. And in the past, we've been very good at identifying people later in the disease, but not so good at identifying people earlier in the disease. And this is part of making that shift from just dealing with disease to dealing with kidney wellness, finding people when they still haven't progressed yet and where they are. So to do that, we've, we've set about building a registry, and um, this is based on our very powerful informatic system promise that already is kind of a one-of-a-kind system that other places wish they had something like. And now we're actually developed a one-of-a-kind, one first in Canada, first really any, uh, anywhere, comprehensive registry for all pr British Columbians living with the disease, regardless of how advanced they are, regardless of whether they're on treatment or off treatment. We've brought some of the insights from the GN registry over to this realm, and we're started, do started doing this. Now, we started enrolling about four months ago, um, so you know we're still in early days yet. And, and I really do want to tip my hat to all the people who are doing the work. Uh, a lot of this is happening in individual offices and private clinics, and so a lot of people who have, have done a lot of great work to register people. So before we set about this, this is what we knew about PKD in the province. Um, and when you see, this is much smaller, obviously, than those estimates I gave you before. Um, and you can see we knew about people when they progressed. You see all the people that we've transplanted. That's a great testament to Dr. Landsberg and his team with the work that we're transplanting a lot of PKD patients. We know about people on dialysis, but we only had a small fraction of people who hadn't yet progressed to end stage. We know the patients are coming from somewhere. We know that PKD is the fourth leading cause of end stage renal disease in Canada, but yet we were not capturing those people. So now here's where we are after just four months of using the registry. And I'm really excited to show this, that you can see that where we've really made the gains, and this is in the green bar, is in those people who are not on dialysis. In just four months, we've more than doubled um, you know, the amount of people that we used to know about living with the disease. And when we break apart that 485, those, those people who are earlier in their disease, again, I'm very excited about this, that 241, most of those are people who have been registered just over the last few months. So we've identified people who are still in a very, very early stage of their disease. And this is going to be critical if we want to actually going to go ahead and treat these people aggressively and try and modify their disease course. So my hat's off to everyone who's, who's helped and played a big part in this registration. I think we still have uh, some room to go and some more uh, numbers to, to, to get. And I think before long, you'll see that we'll have one of the biggest registries of this disease anywhere in the world. Um, and when we look across uh, uh, where this is happening, it's across all different health authorities. I didn't label them. Some health authorities obviously are larger than other health authorities. But when I look at it, there, you know, there's, there's across the board uptake. There are still some pockets where maybe there's some, some uh, room to do more with the registry. And those of you will be hearing from me in the next little while, now that I have the data and know where you are. Uh, but you know, this, this really is an across the province effort. So, so my thanks to you for that. So, there is more work to do, and right now, with this first cut of the data at four months, all I've done so far is just say, where are the people, and, and what stage of disease are they at? But you'll see that we're gonna be doing two things. We're gonna keep pushing with the registration to get the numbers up and up and up, and, get, and, and, and really try and capture the entire burden of disease in the province. And now we're gonna start using some of this data. And I'm gonna come back to this uh, a little bit uh, in the next few minutes um, to actually see how we can uh, use what we're capturing to transform and improve clinical care. 
And in the long run, what I see is this is gonna be a model for other disease states. It's not just good enough to say that we have X number of CKD patients in the province. While that's obviously a great metric, we're gonna start teasing that apart a little bit more so that we can focus on different areas of diseases and give them the attention they deserve. So the next little thing I wanna talk about, one of my other big initiatives is how we're gonna be bringing some of these new tools into clinical practice. And, and I couldn't have asked for a better segue into my talk with all this wonderful data from CRISP that, that people like Dr. Chapman have been pioneering. So the way, oh, right, uh, you know, this is the other question I'm gonna skip. You know, if you really wanna know the answers for this, ask me later. I had to Google volumes of different fruit. You know how, you know how hard it is to find a volume of a fruit? Uh, that's not on Google, but anyways, I did figure it out. And this just goes back to what we were saying is that we're really talking about the velocity of growth when we're looking at these tools. So in someone like a 30-year-old, you would say a grapefruit, or specifically a pink grapefruit, would be a big-sized uh, <laughs> uh, kidney. Whereas in a 60-year-old, it would have to be cauliflower size before you'd actually start calling it a big kidney. Because it's all about how fast they got to that, uh, to that size. So this is the exact same slide that Dr. Chapman said, is that we're using this, and we've really understood the value in the last few years of tracking the rate of velo or the velocity of kidney expansion in, in polycystic disease as an early and robust marker of where these patients are, uh, how these patients are doing, and providing them with individual prognostication. So now the challenge really is bringing this into our everyday clinical practice. So, and yeah, um, as I just mentioned, you know, the one thing, the one point I want to uh, highlight is Dr. Chapman talked about some of those other endpoints, things like hypertension, proteinuria, urologic complications. I'd actually say that while those are markers of how someone's going to do, in many senses, they're also signs that your patient has already progressed. In other words, if we really want to push the envelope upstream, we want to know well before that. So this is where imaging is going to come in, and the day that we meet someone for the first time, we can provide them with some kind of prognostication of what their disease course is going to look like. And this is going to be the imaging-based uh, tools. So, um, and this exact, I won't belabor this point because Dr. Chapman uh, uh, spoke to this wonderfully. Again, we're looking at velocity of growth and a very, very strong relationship to loss in, in kidney function. So there's a couple different ways we can do this now. We have to actually um, bring some of that data into the real world. Much of that data focuses on MRI and, and uh, like we heard, very manual, labor-intensive stereology that, that takes a long time for the radiologists. And when we look at it, we have some of these new and complex tests. And whenever we um, mention things like this, I even saw an editorial once that called it the new kid on the block, and I immediately think of this. Um, when I hear that term, maybe I'm dating myself. Um, but you know, so you have things that are brand new, they're colorful, they're great, there's new technology involved. If you look in the little corner, uh, the bottom corner, it says compact disc. That was, you know, revolutionary technology at the time. It's fantastic. But we have some older stuff too. And you know, you look at the picture on the right and you think, what value is there here? You know, there's not much color, it's all gray and black. They don't even look that happy to be in this picture. It's like they signed a bad contract or something. But then I found out that, you know, there's people out there, like, for example, my wife, who would pay just an unreasonable amount of money uh, to go see these people in, con in uh, concert. And so you think there must be some value here. If, if there's some value out of these old things. And when we're talking about these tests, it's, you know, talking about MRI, cross-sectional, high-tech, total kidney volume measurement, and good old-fashioned ultrasound. Sure, it's not flashy, it's not great, but maybe there's some good information there. And so ultrasound's a thing I want to talk about. It's something that, I've, that I think we've actually made some big gains on here. And the important thing to recognize is that everybody gets an ultrasound. We recently did a Canadian survey, and over 90% of PKD patients are having ultrasounds as their first imaging test. So it's already there. And as we heard from Dr. Chapman, there's actually some very robust and reliable data that you can get from ultrasound if it's done right. Specifically, things like the kidney length can be a very, very good predictor. It's just a matter of doing it properly. And the key really is standardization and making sure that our radiologists are doing it well. So this is something that you should start seeing in the next month or so. So through collaboration with our radiology colleagues and the BC Radiologic Society, we've actually standardized how they're going to report ultrasounds in polycystic disease patients. And so you're gonna start seeing much better reports. So on the, on the left, I have uh, what the old reports looked like, and this is, I copy and pasted an exact report. And when you read through it, the clinicians of the room are saying, yeah, you're nodding their heads and kind of smiling. That's not all that helpful to us. And, and it's not that the radiologists weren't trying to be helpful, it's that they thought this is what we wanted. It was a matter of talking to them and actually saying, these are the pieces of information that we need from our ultrasounds. And just by doing that, we've been able to standardize to something that, that you'll see on the right. And you can see now we're getting actually high value information here. 
They're t using very standardized diagnostic uh, criteria whenever they're looking at a scan for, for um, polycystic disease. They'll actually tell us, based on that Mayo or Irazabal classification, whether this is a typical or atypical morphology, they'll give us a kidney length precisely, and if need be, they'll say that maybe you need something a little bit more precise. So just by doing it this way and standardizing it, I think that we'll be able to get a lot of value out of our ultrasounds. And in this whole era of choosing wisely and el eliminating unnecessary tests, I think we may not even have to go towards things like MRIs for, for a lot of patients. This will, this will suffice. If we are going to cross-sectional total kidney volume measurements in PFO, we again need to know how to do this properly. And, and this is a challenge to bring this into the real world. You know, a lot of places that are doing it, to get this scan, you have to go to the quaternary care center, get your total kidney volume measured, and that's the only way to do it. And that's not what we want to do. We want to bring this everywhere across the province. It's a bit of an uphill battle. This is something that's very new to them, very unfamiliar. I've had to bring to the radiologist the papers showing how, to dis you, know, how you go about calculating this. Um, there are some a issues about MRI. People are worried, well, if I'm doing a multi-phase scan that takes 45 minutes, how am I going to get people in for it? And the interpretation can be very time-consuming, especially if the radiologists are unfamiliar with it. So we're actually just about halfway through a pilot right now at St. Paul's Hospital where, again, we're looking at bringing this into the real world. We're taking the gold standard that you can get at the Mayo Clinic and how are we going to bring this everywhere else. And we're looking at a few different things. We're looking at an abbreviated MRI protocol, so all of a sudden now you can do it in a few minutes. They can fit it between scans. It's very easy to do. We're looking at some of those validated ellipsoid equations. Again, making sure that everyone is being consistent. So if um, you get a scan up in Prince George and one in Vancouver, you know that you're comparing apples to apples. And we're including some ultra-low-dose CT protocols. These are fantastic things. We're talking about a couple of x-rays worth of exposure. So in your real outline areas that don't even have MRI, you would still have access to, to total kidney volume. And the, uh, the end goal of all of this is to take that gold standard research tool and bring it into a clinical uh, solution that is accessible to all of our uh, patients across the province. So by sometime early next year, I think you'll see this, and we'll have a, a standardized way of reporting total kidney volume that all British Columbians will have access to. It has a core lab kind of a model where we have the outline centers that check in every now and again with St. Paul's and are validated to make sure that we're getting good information. And the last thing that I think we can talk about, so we've talked about finding the patients, we've talked about prognosticating and uh, testing them, and now we'll talk about the treatments. Um, and uh, we actually, if you're paying, uh, listening to Dr. Chapman, she actually answered this question already that about 50% of our patients by age 30 have had some kind of complication. And so I think that there's really a few areas that we can highlight here. We can maximize what we're doing with the treatments that already exist. We can use some of the new treatments that are coming out there and, and, and figure out the best way to bring them into our, our, our care for patients with PD, PKD. And I think we need to do a better job of addressing the whole symptom uh, burden in these patients. So this is the HALT PKD trial that, uh, that Dr. Chapman talked about. I'm not going to belabor the, exist, uh, the, the evidence there or talk about it in any detail. Just suffice it to say that it's a wonderful study that tells you that something as simple as uh, being really strict about your blood pressure control, you can really change someone's disease course. And this is one of the reasons that we're doing something like building a registry, because this is where having that powerful informatics uh, behind us can actually help move the envelope and, and inform our quality uh, improvement initiatives. This is how we've been able to move the envelope on things like vascular access and you know, referral for early transplant. Because again, and if you don't have the data, we can't say how we're doing. So one of the things we're gonna be looking at is how are we doing with blood pressure control as a province? Is there ways we can improve it? And are there systematic uh, changes that we can make to make sure we're getting those treatments to our, our, our patients? And eventually, through, these, uh, through this registry, you'll be able to use some of these promise-related tools as a self-audit as well. So you'll be able to go in there and say, how am I as an individual clinician doing with blood pressure in my polycystic kidney disease patients, and can I be better? And so this is how we're really going to push the envelope uh, uh, on treatment. We just heard about uh, Tolvaptin as well. So this is a new disease-modifying treatment. It's a first in disease treatment. It's rare that you see that. You know, we see first in class treatments all the time, but a first in disease treatment is really a unique thing. This is, all, this is the only thing that we have to, to modify the actual disease course. From what we know, based on really one trial, is that um, this is not for everybody. It's about finding a select subset of patients with more aggressive disease and getting them treatment. Now, when this first came out about a year ago, we all talked about it, and in, in BC, there was a lot of uh, a lot of the clinicians had some uncertainty. This was brand new. They didn't know what to do with it. They wanted to see some real-world information about it, and they wanted to even contribute to the growing evidence. 
So we've kind of heard that loud and clear, and this is where we're at now with, uh, with, with Tolvapen and BC. So based on feedback, we've created independently uh, made uh, uh, tools to assist the clinicians. When we were doing this, there was no guidelines anywhere. Um, we kind of sat together as a group and said, in the absence of guidelines, what do we all think is reasonable to do with this drug? And that's what we came up with. And now we have a whole host of tools. They'll be updated as Canadian guidelines come out, which are coming soon. Um, but we have tools that we can be very proud of and that have been very helpful. And one of the very, very clear points is that we wanted to use this registry we were creating to make sure that we had the safety monitoring because of this concern with, with, with liver enzymes. So I can say we actually have a higher level of monitoring than anywhere else in Canada uh, that is using the drug. And we're actually able to collect in real time outcomes from these patients as well. So this is gonna be a very, very powerful tool. And as we move forward, it will really help us analyze um, what the role of this, this drug is in, in our patients. And then lastly, the thing we need to do, again, this, you saw this exact slide uh, not long ago, um, is address the symptom burden. And, and the one thing I think that's flown under the radar and is really starting to come to light now is that even though these early stage patients, they're doing okay kidney function wise, there is a high burden of symptoms. The fact that 50% of people have had some kind of complication uh, by age 30, you know, really speaks volumes. And there's, this was a fantastic compilation of qu uh, qualitative studies that when you go back and ask patients what it is they're worried about, there's a whole layer of emotional and psychological burden of this disease that we aren't really capturing. People are worried about their job and what's gonna happen when their employer finds out that they need a transplant. They're worried about their family members, what's gonna happen if they get screened for their brother's life insurance. These are things that really come out. I've had the you know, privilege to be involved with some patient forums and focus groups that the Kidney Foundation has hosted. And it, it's, it's one of these things where you really kind of take a step back and say, wow, what we're worried about as clinicians is completely different from what the patients are worried about. And if we're not doing the job of addressing those concerns that the patients have, we're really not addressing the whole burden of their disease. So I think, you know, and with the theme of, of transitions and transformations, I think that one of the places that we can do it is us as clinicians have to transform a little bit too. And I think we're doing this and I think we're getting there. But I think where we need to, to see is in the past, we've done things like this with our PKD patients. We've diagnosed them, we've tested them, then we kind of said, let's watch your GFR, keep your blood pressure in check, and when it's time for transplant, we'll get you set up. And I think where we're moving to and where we're gonna get is that we're actually gonna start addressing the whole burden of this disease. Right from day one, when someone comes in, instead of saying, I'm gonna watch your GFR and try to figure out what happens to you, right from day one, we're gonna say, I'm gonna prognosticate you and tell you what to expect over the next 10, 20, 30 years of your life and how we're gonna manage it. And we're really gonna tailor our treatments to make sure that especially in those patients with aggressive disease, that we're targeting as early and as aggressively as we can to try to actually change the disease course. How we're gonna get there, this is what you know, keeps me going and what I'm gonna be working on over probably the next year and, and into the future, is we have a very strong record of doing things like this. Taking uh, areas where there's you know, a little bit of evidence but a lot of uncertainty and still coming up with some standardized way to build a best practice of care. You know, we can sit around, and some people have done this in something like polycystic disease, argue who needs a scan of their head and how often are we doing it, and you kind of quibble back and forward so long that you lose the forest for the trees and just say that if we can be standardized and care for these patients in a comprehensive way, we'll be doing them a service. We'll be able to leverage our experience with that as well as our strong relationships with patient groups to, to really, I think, bring uh, care for these patients into the next level. So stay tuned. You'll probably hear more of this, uh, you know, in the next year or so. Um, and that's, those are the things I have to say. You know, I, I'm, really, um, I'm really proud to, 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 and pleased to have someone like Dr. Chapman come and talk about all this wonderful clinical research. And now we have the, the advantage of bringing that to help improve the care of our patients. Thanks. In the interest of time, um, I'm going to ask if anybody has any questions for Dr. Chapman or Dr. Bravlacqua to maybe ask them over lunch. And I'd just like, again, to congratulate both of them for a fantastic session, for an update and on initiatives, as well as a review of polycystic kidney disease, which we see every day. Uh, round of applause. Thank you.